students at the University of Auckland, and that actually is a cohort of several hundred students. So I, I convinced her to come work in the lab for a summer project in 2004, and she had so much fun that she came back in 2005. She then continued on with her honors, which is the fourth year degree, which includes a, a thesis in Alana's case, the equivalent of a master's thesis that she completed in one year, along with coursework. Then I um, convinced her also to take her uh, Fulbright International PhD fellowship and bring it here to uh, Oregon State University in 2008. And she finished only six years. So she started with three years of funding, but anyway. But she finished, she did finish independent in 2014, in fact, right here. From there, she went on to, uh, to a position as a genomic specialist uh, at the Biodiversity Institute at the University of Kansas, taking along uh, with her, her uh, partner. <laughs> <laughs> Good timing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then in 2017, took out a position of bioinformatics uh, postdoctoral researcher uh, at the University of Otago in Dunedin, New Zealand. In 2019, she was awarded a, uh, a Rutherford postdoctoral fellowship where she uh, intends to do some far-fetched projects on whole genomics with Hector's dolphins. We're going to hear about that, as well as a walk through ecological time traveling. Thanks a lot. Cool. Are you green? I'm green, yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me, folks. Uh, I had been back in New Zealand for about two years, so my accent will have thickened and my English will have sped up. So I've got a couple of plants in the back of the room to try and get me to slow down if they become too incomprehensible. Um, in saying that, I'm a lot less nervous than the last time I was in this room with the sperm whale as the backdrop, which was during my PhD defense in 2014. So hopefully I won't be uh, too fast in terms of uh, my English. So I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that I've uh, been involved in since I left OSU. Um, as well as a few uh, hypotheses left over from my PhD. But first, um, if Scott hadn't, well, oh, wait. Of course, technical difficulties, why not? Is it working? <laughs> wait, maybe I need to click technical on Technical I bet you if I do one click on here, it's probably going to pick it up. It's right now. Yep, it was just that it wasn't clicked on the PowerPoint. Cool. Okay, uh, so many of you probably know where New Zealand is, the series of islands down in the South Pacific. And one of the cool things about growing up there is you end up being immediately invested in ecology because we have a bunch of weird critters that aren't found anywhere else. So we've got the nocturnal kiwi, we've got the tuatara, which is an extinct remnant of an, a lineage that's gone extinct everywhere else, and glowworms, which if you're ever down in New Zealand, definitely go check out the glowworm caves. They're a bit of a, a, a sight to see. Because it's surrounded by water, there's also a fair number of marine ecologists who get spawned in New Zealand. This is me going to sea with Big Ted in my bedroom when I was a, a young person. Um, so basically, as a kid down there, it's very easy to see how weird and wacky New Zealand's fauna is. But there is a dark side to this, because New Zealand is an island ecosystem. Like many other island ecosystems, it's very th prone to anthropogenic effects. Um, in fact, so much so that when I looked up extinct New Zealand birds, Google actually gave me a slideshow you could flick through. Uh, most of these went extinct after humans arrived in New Zealand. The reasons for this are very common to other areas of the globe. They include habitat loss, in New Zealand's case primarily deforestation, direct exploitation and hunting, including sperm whaling. So this is a picture from the early sperm whaling industry in New Zealand. And predation, because New Zealand has no native land mammals, all of the mammals, land mammals apart from two species of bat, have been introduced. And the bird species are very naive and just get chomped on as a result. So that taught me why ecology is really important and why conservation biology is very important. But if my few forays into the field, which don't happen very much because I get seasick, have taught me anything, it's that ecology is really, really hard. So samples can be hard to come by. And I've got sperm whales up here because they'll be the first example of research that I talk about in this talk. They're one of the quintessential hard-to-come-by species. Kaikoura in New Zealand is one of the very few places in the world where you can see them within sight of land. And even if you get out to where the sperm whales are, 
catching them at the surface is very difficult. They're basically a deep water animal that happens to hang out on the surface some of the time. So the dives can be up to an hour and a half long. So you have to, have to be timing it right to get there when they're there. Studies often also have to be quite long, long term to infer processes that are occurring in these populations. So things like photo ID, such as the study by Jero and Whitehead in the Caribbean, used a simply mammoth amount of sea effort in photo ID to infer that this population was undergoing a long term decline. And then we also have techniques that give really awesome fine scale spatial information, such as the tagging groups uh, out here at Hatfield's work. But because these tags take a lot of expertise and money, it can be hard to implement them at a huge wide scale. This is important because some species like sperm whale show patterns that are evident over broad scales that aren't evident at local scales, such as sex segregation. So the female sperm whales and their dependent offspring are only found into temperate waters, whereas the males can be found down into polar waters. So it turns out ecology is hard and marine ecology is really, really hard. This is also what happens if you Google an invisible whale. Uh, this appears to be a cartoon still from the 1970s show Super Friends, where Aquaman is getting in by the whale. I would have thought it would be Superman, but there you go. <laughs> okay, so one potential solution is to try and get around these sampling difficulties by using genetics. Because the process for obtaining genetic samples is relatively simple, uh, we don't have to go out and encounter the same whale repeatedly like we would have to with photo ID in order to make inferences. Um, so this allows us to build out our sampling into larger spatial scales, which then allows us to sample animals over larger areas, particularly as the investment per sampling event can be lower than other um, ways of monitoring these populations. And then, because genetic processes integrate all of the things that have been going along over the ancestor of that individual that's been sampled, it also allows us to get at things that might have been happening in the distant past, just based on that one sample. So this is why I'm calling this talk ecological time traveling. We're using the power of that genetic sample to try and look at what's been going on in that population through time. So the examples I'm going to talk about today are some work that's been following on from my PhD research. It involves very broad global spatial scales going back over the last 125,000 years in sperm whales. I'll also be talking about some more recent uh, time scales, particularly in the example of chickadees. So just a few decades and a couple of kilometers, or I guess I should say miles, now that I'm back up in the US. <laughs> and then finally, I'm going to round off of talking about the current project that I'm working on, funded by the Rutherford Fellowship. Before I jump into this, I know not everyone's a geneticist in the room, so I thought I'd just give a very quick crash course in genetics. So when I say genetics, a lot of people will think of nuclear DNA, which is biparentally inherited. You get one copy from your mum and one copy from your dad. So each of these individuals here has got a different chromosomal arrangement to either of their parents. There is another kind of DNA I'm going to be talking about today, and that is mitochondrial DNA. This is a little different because it only comes down through the maternal line. So in our little whale family here, both the male and the female offspring share the same mitochondrial haplotype, or the stretch of DNA, as their mum. And that's the same thing for everyone in this room. Everyone has the same kind of mitochondrial DNA as their biological mum. I'm going to be talking about mitochondrial DNA a little more in this talk than probably nuclear DNA. So I'm going to talk about a few specific parts of it because otherwise I'll launch straight into it and you won't know what I'm talking about. So the mitochondrial DNA is a big circular molecule. It's about 15,000 to 20,000 base pairs in length. The specific bits I'm going to be talking about today include the control region, specifically the first 400 to 600 base pairs. The reason we like using this marker a lot is that it's not, um, it doesn't appear to code for anything. So it's a little more free to accumulate variation, which allows it to be a bit easier for tracing patterns. I'm also going to be talking about some of the proteins. These are involved in the electron transport pathway, so are really critical for energy metabolism in all of us, including whales. And then finally, I'll be talking about the whole fragment, and this term is the mitogenome. So because it's maternally inherited, this whole marker is very useful for tracing patterns of maternal movement and gene flow. So I've been talking about, or well, using whales as an example here, and that's because they're a really interesting system to do these kind of analyses. They were affected by commercial hunting at a really industrial scale, which led to several populations being hunted to commercial extinction, and also inspired some great literature such as Moby Dick. What's really interesting about this hunting is that in the decades since, there's been populations that have failed to recover, even though in the case of sperm whales, we know that they're capable 
of traveling thousands of miles. And what's also interesting is that there seems to be uh, declines that can happen in neighboring populations to those that were actually affected by whaling, because it seems like some of the whales may be depopulating and moving. So it was against this backdrop that I carried out a lot of my PhD research, which was interested in looking at the factors that might be affecting movement in sperm whales, which I'm not actually going to talk about much at all today, but I would like to acknowledge my co-authors on it, other than to say it seems like female philopatry, or the <coughs> tendency of females to stay at home, is what was driving a lot of the patterns that we see in sperm whale genetic structure. What I am going to talk about is a finding that was reinforced during my PhD studies, and that's that sperm whales have really low mitochondrial diversity. So our updated results are shown by the little arrow in the black bar there. The number of haplotypes, or different stretches of DNA, found for the mitochondrial control region were brought up by our study more in line with the rest of the, bars, rest of the species here. But nucleotide diversity in the orange, which is a measure of how, on average, different each whale is to each other based on this uh, gene fragment, remained really, really low. And this was in comparison to species such as the beluga whale, which is found only in the Arctic, the Pacific white-sided dolphin, guess where that's found, the harbour porpoise, only found in the northern hemisphere, when in comparison, the sperm whale is found pretty much everywhere. It was also in comparison to species such as the humpback whale, which we know were far more affected by whaling than the sperm whale was. So based on this, I set up a whole bunch of hypotheses and collected a whole bunch of data to try and te tease apart what was going on. Um, I know I said that I was only going to be presenting uh, stuff that I'd done since I left Oregon State, but uh, two of my favorite hypotheses that I, I addressed during my PhD, I'm also going to go along here, um, mostly because they have some rainbow whales as a demonstration diagram, and that was something that my lab tended to know me for during my lab presentation. <laughs> Okay, so let's start off with the slow mutation rates. With a normal mutation rate through time, we have mutation events, which are shown by the stars, creating these new haplotypes, which are represented by the different colors. So this is a normal, fast mutation rate. If mutation rates slow down, there are fewer mutations through time, and therefore fewer haplotypes created. So here we've just got three different mitochondrial haplotypes compared to seven in the original uh, uh, demonstration. So to try and get at why this was, we generated a whole bunch of mitogenomes, so the whole fragment, uh, using long-range PCR and a bunch of the very new next-generation technologies that were available during my PhD, including the GS Junior 454, MySeq, and the old-school Illumina GIX. And all the young students nowadays won't even know what those are, because we've moved on already, apart from the MySeq, I guess. So using the sperm whale and a bunch of other cetaceans, I constructed a phylogenetic tree. So in this case, the phylogenetic tree, the branch lengths are proportional to the total number of mutations that have occurred in that lineage over time. But what we wanted to get at is how fast were these rate of substitution through time. So to do that, we had to find a way to try and calibrate it by time points. And we did this by finding a few, not us personally, but finding in the literature a few fossils that had well-characterized dates. And by using these fossils to peg the tree, what we could do is break down the tree into the amount of time that had occurred between lineages splitting and then how fast the rate of evolution had been down those, those lineages. And when we did that, what we found was the sperm whale was actually quite fast in terms of its control region rate and reasonably similar to the rest of the cetaceans in terms of its protein coding rates. So it doesn't actually look, doesn't actually look like a rate slowdown is, uh, the, is the thing responsible for the low mitochondrial diversity in these species. So I next moved on to having a look at a selective sweep hypothesis, and this comes in two, favor, two flavors, a cultural selective sweep or one related to the protein coding regions. So I'm just going to step through the cultural selective sweep. So we've got our rainbow whales back again. This time the oval represents this fact that this is actually a social group comprised of many different whales, but my PowerPoint creating uh, skills weren't good enough to put multiple whales per social group. So just pretend this is actually like, say, four to six whales with the same mitochondrial haplotype. So the haplotypes are shown by the colors, and then a few of them have got these crowns. And these crowns represent beneficial innovations, behaviors that they show. So what might these be? Well, sperm whales show a lot of variation in the amount of uh, parental care that they give to the calves, including alloparental care, where aunties may look after calves while the mums are diving. There's also variation in predator defense. When you've got your calves and a predator is approaching, do you bunch up with your heads in, tails facing the predator, or opposite way around. 
There also might be some beneficial innovations in how they subdue food. And there's been some real cool work coming out of the whale tagging group, which implies cooperative foraging amongst sperm whales. So different strategies may, may have different beneficial um, returns in terms of getting uh, food for the pod. So those whales that have those beneficial innovations, we're expecting them to be able to outcompete the others in the population. As they do, they're also going to drag their mitochondrial haplotype along with them. And that's because they're inheriting both that beneficial behavior from their mum, as well as their maternally inherited mitochondrial haplotype. So in this case, we've gone from seven haplotypes at the beginning of the scenario here to just three at the end. So mathematical modeling has shown in order for this hypothesis to hold, about 95% of the pods need to be strictly matrilineal. So they have to be the descendants of just one female. What's neat is we can try and get at this in our data set by looking at the number of mitochondrial haplotypes we have in each social group. Because if there's more than one mitochondrial haplotype, we know that there has to be more than one female ancestor. And therefore, the groups cannot be strictly matrilineal. So when we did this for our data set, only 38% of the groups turned out to be strictly matrilineal, which is a shame because it's a really pretty theory slain by ugly facts. <laughs> So the next kind of selective sweep we can have is protein related. So I mentioned at the beginning, well, no, actually, I'm going to talk about both of the next hypotheses together. And that reason for this will become apparent in just a few slides time. First thing I want to mention here is that molecular ecologists are horrible people. So instead of plotting something like past to present in a logical way going from left to right, all of the plots in this presentation will be reversed. I apologize. We are, like I say, just horrible people. So a population bottleneck reduces diversity because as individuals are shared from the population, so is the unique genetic diversity that they hold. As the population recovers, it can only retain the diversity that made it through the middle of the bottleneck. And then gradually additional diversity can be recovered through mutation events. I should mention whaling here because obviously that might spring to mind as a bottleneck that, that sperm whales could have undergone. It actually looks like the level of uh, population decrease driven by whaling was probably not enough to have caused a bottleneck in sperm whales in terms of impacts on their genetic diversity. So when I say population bottleneck here, I'm talking about processes that actually predate human exploitation. Okay, selective sweep. I mentioned before that the protein coding genes in the sperm whale help out with, uh, electro with uh, energy metabolism. One of the key inputs into this uh, process is oxygen. And obviously when sperm whales are at depth, they're very oxygen limited. So you can imagine that a female sperm whale who had some kind of mutation in her protein coding genes could be able to die for longer, obtain more prey, and therefore have an edge over the other females in the population, which she would then pass on to her offspring with her mitochondrial DNA. Okay, so the reason that I couldn't tell the difference between these very easily during my PhD is I only had mitogenome data and both of these hypotheses are expected to have a very similar effect on mitogenome diversity, reducing it. What I really needed to try and tease them apart was nuclear DNA. And in this case here, a population bottleneck will reduce the diversity of both kinds of DNA, whereas a selective sweep, we're expecting to leave the nuclear DNA relatively untouched. So to look at this, um, we used a method called the pairwise, I don't even know what it's called, the pairwise sequential Markovian coalescent, which is a bit of a mouthful, so I'm going to call it PSMC. So the inputs into this process are whole genome sequencing, so sequencing all of the nuclear DNA from an individual. The way it works is through coalescence, which is a bit of a scary concept, but I promise it's not too horrible. So imagine we've got our population of four haploid individuals. What the coalescent is trying to talk about is what the average time is as you go back in the past before those two copies of the alleles coalesce in the same common ancestor. And it's directly proportional to the number of individuals in that population. So we've got four haploid individuals here, and the expected time until those copies are found in the same ancestor is four, which is shown by this ET here. However, although that's the expected time, there's a lot of variation around that. In diploid animals, such as the sperm whale and us, it'll actually be twice that length of time, and that's because we each carry two copies of the same allele. In a larger population, the expected time to the coalescence for all of these alleles will be larger. So based on this, when mutations occur, they tend to occur in copies that have coalesced further in the past, because there's been more time for mutations to hit. So if we see a mutation between two pairs of an allele, 
it implies to us that that coalescent time happened further back in the past. That's really handy for us because we don't actually see all these patterns of descent. All we see in the present time is the pattern of diversity that we've got here. So we're using those number of mutational steps and a given mutation rate to try and figure out how far back in time those alleles shared a common ancestor. The PSMC method then tries to fit a population size that maximizes the likelihood that we observe the time to most recent common ancestor that we do. So in this case here, we've got, we've got a, a population size here that doesn't seem to fit in our, our observed data. So what the PSMC method will do is it will then increase that population size so that it fits the data better. It's not just doing a flat line because that's not very realistic for a real population. So it's breaking this down into a bunch of different time chunks and allowing them to change in population size until we fit the data that we observe best. There's one more wrinkle, and that's that we're putting in whole genome sequence data. We expect that things like chromosomes are going to have sites that are very highly linked because they're close to each other and haven't been broken up by recombination. So the first step in this method is trying to infer where those recombination breakpoints are. So in this case here, we can imagine that our blue and our green gene could be these two sections here and then another one here for the mauve. So when we applied this method to the sperm out data, what we found was actually a pattern very similar to what we expected under a population bottleneck. So there was a steep decline through the Pliocene, followed by an increase that roughly correlated to the last glacial maxima. We also looked for signs of a selective sweep, and although we found signatures of selection on the mitochondrial DNA, because we're seeing this pattern of low diversity in both the mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear DNA, this makes it most likely that a population bottleneck is what explains this pervasive low diversity. So that's neat, but it's only kind of half the question, right? Like, knowing that the sperm whales went through a population bottleneck is not as interesting as knowing why that might be. So to try and get at this, we carried out some habitat reconstructions. So we knew that the sperm oil uh, decrease was roughly associated with the Pliocene, which was a period of global cooling. So we carried out a reconstruction both for the modern day and also for the last glacial maximum, a particularly cool recent period. What we found was that there was a latitudinal constriction during the last glacial maximum. This makes sense, it was colder, you might not want to go quite as close to the poles. But what was really interesting is that we found this pattern of really poor habitat suitability in the Atlantic. This was really puzzling to us because we know that sperm whales have rather, relatively broad temperature um, tolerances. So the idea that the Atlantic could be particularly on, inhospitable to them, but not the, say, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean was a little bit strange. So what we think might be going on is that it may be driven by their prey species. So squid, some squid species, seem to be particularly sensitive to temperature, generally preferring warmer temperatures. And studies on the jumbo squid and the giant squid have shown that they underwent an expansion following the last glacial maximum. So perhaps squid were more heavily affected by these temperature regimes than sperm whales. And as they've increased in abundance, sperm whales have followed them along with that and increased in their own abundance with warmer temperatures. So I'd like just to finish this section. Oh, well, yes, I guess I could start with why it's important to time travel via molecular ecology. I forgot to mention earlier, this is mostly for Debbie, who's a big Doctor Who fan, that the TARDIS is a time machine for those of you who don't watch Doctor Who with a bit of DNA. OK, so I think it's really important to point out that this, this low diversity doesn't seem to be causing any contemporaneous effects on sperm whales. Things like ship strike and other, uh, other factors that are currently affecting them are causing much more damage than any patterns of diversity. So why is it important? Well, I think sperm whales are really cool personally. They're a really neat species. They've got this unique sex, sex segregation, a number of really cool adaptations, and a cool social structure. So to me, finding out what's going on in their past population size is just really neat. But we also rely on these methods for inferring how whales are moving between areas and what populations might be isolated. This is important because there are processes that are still going on today that can affect sperm whale abundance, including entanglement, legacy effects from whaling, pollution, deep water horizon obviously was probably not great for sperm whales, and then things like ship strike because they sleep right below the, uh, the surface. So if there are other processes affecting our markers, it's important to take those into account when we're trying to look at population structure and how these animals may be moving between areas. Okay, with that I'm going to take a hard right turn. So I finished my PhD and I moved out to Kansas, and this may or may not surprise you, but 
there's not that many people doing field research on whales in Kansas. <laughs> but it turns out that DNA can help you time travel with a whole bunch of different critters. So the next couple of examples I'm going to be talking about are terrestrial. The first of these is a frog radiation from a genus called Kalula in the Philippines. So previous research by Blackburn and others showed that within the Philippines, there's been this adaptive radiation of the genus into three ecotypes. A really squat ground frog with small toe pads, a more arboreal shrub frog that has greater expanded toe pads so it can stick onto the vegetation, and finally a fully arboreal tree hole frog. In their previous research, they tried to construct a tree, and the reason that they wanted to look at this is they wanted to know what the ancestral ecotype looked like. So was it a, a ground frog, was it a tree frog, and how did they evolve into showing this amount of ecotypic uh, diversity? Are these two instances of tree hole and ground frog actually convergent, or how else has this pattern been generated? Unfortunately, with the mitochondrial DNA fragment they used, they couldn't actually get at uh, what these relationships were. So the idea for me for one of my postdoc projects was to swoop in and use some new technologies to try and get a more well-resolved phylogeny. To do this, I used something called an ultra-conserved element, or a UCE. These are, um, are designed by aligning up a whole bunch of really diverse genomes and looking for regions where there is really low divergence or high similarity between the different genomes. These regions are used to, to design baits, our RNA baits, which we then use to fish out these regions from the genomes that we're looking at. So the reason we're doing this rather than sequencing whole genomes is that's still pretty expensive and a lot of data to play with. So by fishing out just a couple of thousand loci, it makes it, uh, makes it available for us to use uh, small budgets, basically, to characterize these species. So the panel I'm talking about today uh, targeted a total of about 5,000 loci. The basic process for this is that you share up your genomic DNA, you stick in the probes, they fish out the things you want to sequence, and then you sequence them. However, they're not 100% efficient. So what actually happened is that the high copy number of uh, mitochondrial DNA, which can be present hundreds of times in the cell, actually managed to sneak its way through. So what we did is we actually used this to assemble the mitogenomes for our samples as well. We constructed trees based on the mitochondrial DNA, and then we also constructed trees based on these thousands of UC, UCE loci. And we had about 1,700 that were found in at least half of our samples. So we used two different main batches of methods for doing this. Concatenated, where you stick them end to end and just treat them like a super gene. And then multi-species coalescent, where we allowed each of the gene trees to have its own little phylogeny and then stuck them together at the end. So when we did this, I did not get an amazingly resolved tree that made my postdoc mentor happy. Instead, I got something that was very familiar to folks who've tried to do phylogenies on complex species groups. And this is areas of really highly supported topological disagreements or lack of resolution in diff using different methods. That's shown by the shaded colors there. There was also a species, Stickleye, that showed a very different placement in the mitochondrial tree at the bottom here compared to all the nuclear trees at the top. So there's a bunch of different processes that we figured out was going on to cause all of this discordance. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this. But today I'm going to focus just on Stickleye, this problem child here. So not being a field biologist, we'll come back to that later on. I relied on my uh, co-authors here. And what they told me is that when they collected Stickleye, uh, it completely matched the previous subspecies description. So they were sure it was Stickleye. But they also noticed it looked roughly halfway between this really squat ground frog and the shrub frog. So we were interested in working out whether this might be an instance of hybridization causing this species. So to get at this, we wrote a program to phase the, the allele. So basically to separate out the position at that gene into the copy inherited from mum and the copy inherited from dad. And then what we did is we looked at the relationships of those different alleles compared to the other species in our data set. Most of the time, what we were expecting, if the sample was from the blue clade here, was for all of the copies to match up to the blue clade. But there might be the occasional copy that showed a different relationship. So here we had a blue allele and a red allele. So this could be because we don't have a lot of resolution in our tree, so it's hard to tell the different species apart at that different locus. Or it could be due to incomplete lineage sorting, which I'll come back to in a sec here. So this stipple pattern here is what I'm using to denote having one allele from one clade and one allele from the other. 
So incomplete lineage sorting. This black tree here shows us our species relationship. So this is what we are pretty sure, based on all the evidence we have to hand, uh, reflects the relationship between those different species. The coloured line inside shows a gene tree. So this is a phylogeny based just on a small segment of DNA. In this case here, and in a lot of cases, it matches up to the species tree perfectly well. The two conjuncta look more similar to each other based on this gene tree than they do to Picta. However, if a mutation arises in the ancestral population, there are the occasional times where it doesn't sort out correctly. So in this case here, this conjuncta individual based on this gene is actually more closely related to this Picta individual than to the other conjuncta individual. You can think of this as a game of Plinko where the genes are dropping down the species tree and they don't necessarily always drop down the correct way that you'd like them to. <laughs> okay, so nonetheless, despite incomplete lineage sorting and maybe a lack of resolution, we expect that the majority of our, our non-hybrid samples will match back to the clade that they're found, with perhaps a small segment where uh, they might show conflicting relationships. On the other hand, if stickli really had been a hybrid, we'd expect to see something completely different. We'd expect to see all of the loci showing this pattern where one allele came from one clade and one allele came from the other, leading up to this fully striped distribution here. So when we ran this on our actual data, that's exactly what we found. So stickli down here is the only sample that shows a, a big degree of this striping pattern here. What's interesting is that it's not completely consistent with a first generation hybrid where we'd expect the whole pie to be striped. Instead, what it seems to be more similar to is a complex backcross, where a hybrid has backcrossed to a, one of the parental species. Again, that's kind of cool to know, but it's not as cool as knowing why. And it turns out the why is habitat modification. So, conjunctor is a shrub frog. It likes to get to the ephemeral breeding pools that this whole genus uses to breed by hoppling along vegetation and then dropping directly down into the pool. Pictor is a ground frog, so it sits uh, squarely on the ground and hops along to the breeding pool. In the cases where these hybrids have been found, there's been a high degree of habitat modification, which has meant conjuncta can't actually just hop along the shrubs, it has to traverse the ground. So the female conjuncta are encountering male picta before they even get to the breeding pools. What's also interesting is based on analyses of the mitogenome, we know that these frog species have been separated for about 15 million years. So it's only very recent anthropogenic effects that are bringing these species back together. Hybridization is also important in the next example I'm going to talk about, which is chickadees. So when I'm down in New Zealand, I have to describe what a chickadee is, and I'm prepared to fight people on this, but I think it is the cutest bird in North America. <laughs> so you guys will obviously well know the chickadee dee dee call that they make, also makes the New Zealanders laugh. But they also have another distinct call. So the black cat uh, birds have a phoebe call that they do, while the Carolina chickadees have a four note call they do. And this can be used to try and tell them apart in the hybrid zone. So these birds come into contact ranging from New York in the east all the way through to Kansas in the west. Although the examples I'm going to be talking about today are mostly based in Missouri at the yellow square here. So the song can be used to tell them apart to a certain extent, although they're very, very capable social learners. So it turns out that if a black cat, pure black cat parental species, hears a Carolina song, it can learn it pretty easily. So that has caused some confusion in the past. In addition, I don't know if you guys can tell, but these birds look very, very similar. And even the experienced ornithologists have difficult to, difficulty telling them apart. So the black cat are a little yellow underneath, and they've got a little bit more white on their wings than the Carolina chickadees. And on average, they're a little bit larger. But of course, in a hybrid zone where you're seeing a mix of these characteristics, it also becomes very difficult to tell the birds apart. Genetics has been used with some effect because you don't have to worry about trying to tr tell them apart by song or morphology based on that. So previous studies on the hybrid zone have revealed some interesting patterns. Particularly in Ohio and Pennsylvania, the hybrid zone is marching north at an extremely quick rate, over 100 kilometers over the last 100 years. There's been some studies in Illinois uh, which have found very little evidence of movement, but these have been based on song data. And as I previously mentioned, it's a little bit problematic with the social learning that goes on. And finally, not a heck of a lot is known about what's going on in the western portion of this contact zone. So this current study came about because one of the uh, collection managers at the Natural History Museum at Kansas had gone out and done a study back in the 1980s on the Missouri population 
where he'd used song, morphology, and allozymes back then, and hadn't really been able to easily <coughs> characterize the hybrid zone based on these markers. So he wanted to know if this newfangled RAD-seq method might be able to tell the hybrids apart. And uh, so we went back to his samples. <laughs> this time there is no DNA on our time-traveling uh, TARDIS, and the reason for this is this isn't using the uh, the coalescent effect of DNA to look at what's going on. This is just to just due to old school archiving of those samples. So it's a testament to how important it is to have funding for making sure we might maintain these archives. So what happened is that Mark went back out in 2016 and tried to densely sample the same area that he densely sampled back in 1978 and 1980. We then used RADSEC. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have heard the genetics team talk about this before. Uh, but it uses restriction enzymes to cut up the DNA, and then we run it through a size selection, where we only take a portion of the fragments within a certain size through our final analysis. So I used the uh, markers SBF and MSP to do the cutting, and selected fragments between 200 to 500 base pairs. We then used structure to infer what proportion of each bird's genome assigned back to black cat chickadee versus Carolina chickadee. And then we used a method called TEST3R to take those results and smush them out onto the landscape. When we did this, we found the same overall pattern between the time periods. And that is, down in the lower southeast, this is how you can tell I'm not a field person, the, the birds were more Carolina. And if you went to the northwest, they were more black cat chickadee. However, another really interesting pattern shows itself when you compare the two time periods. And that's that the, the chickadee hybrid zone has moved northwest about seven kilometers between these sampling periods. So this dark blue contour here was back here in the 1970s to 80s, and the interface, the blue and the red up there, which I'm too short to point to, was back here in the 1970s and 80s. So there's definitely been movement. However, this movement has been much slower than other areas of the range of these chickadees. And so our next question was, why is this? When we looked at the difference in temperature between 1976 and 1980, in 2012 and 2016, we found that Pennsylvania had warmed up to 50% more than Missouri. And so that likely explains the difference in the speed of movement between these hybrid zones. So why is this important? Well, what it suggests is that species that have really large, extensive ranges are going to be affected very differently by climate change over local scales, depending on what's going on with those climates. This is important because people make huge scale inferences about what might be going on, such as I did a couple of examples ago with the sperm whale. So this suggests that we have to be careful when we're talking about these species with big global ranges in terms of specific impacts that might be going on. OK, because this is a marine science seminar, I probably should come back to the marine realm. So I'm just going to quickly step through some uh, ongoing work that I'm doing down at the University of Otago on these guys. So they are the smallest marine mammal, marine dolphin in the world, and they're distributed as two subspecies around New Zealand. The Maui dolphin around the North Island, and the Hector's dolphin around the South Island. They're listed as critically endangered for the Maui dolphin and endangered for the Hector's dolphin. And they've largely got this way through fisheries pressure. So they, cut, they come up as bycatch in both commercial and recreational gill netting, and also in trawls. One of the difficulties, though, is we don't really know what their population size was like before monofilament nets started impacting on them, because most of the uh, looking at what their population size was is based on extrapolating back from current population sizes and current fisheries pressure. What we do know from work by Scott and others is that this uh, fisheries pressure is likely to have caused an erosion of genetic diversity. So we've got contemporary samples on the right here, historical samples on the left, and the haplotypes shown in red are those that have been lost from the contemporary sample. In the Maui dolphin in the top row, and in the East Coast Hector's dolphin on the bottom row there. And then over time, back when Scott and Franz wrote this paper, it looked like this was going to cause ongoing erosion of genetic diversity. So fortunately, there's been a number of key exclusions of fisheries from, particular, from areas where uh, Hector's and Maui dolphins are particularly densely found. Um, although some research suggests that these exclusion zones probably need to be a little larger to completely avoid population impacts. So this uh, example here of the Hector's Dolphin Court and a gill net occurred just six nautical miles north of the Banks Peninsula Marine Mammal Sanctuary. However, there is another threat that is, ar that is arising. So fisheries pressure can be, is largely controlled in a lot of the Hector's and Maui Dolphin range. 
but we're seeing increasing numbers of disease cases affecting these guys. So this one made the news back in October last year in New Zealand. It was a very pregnant Maui dolphin who, who beach cast. This is obviously concerning because in such a small population, losing a successfully breeding female from the population is, is bad news. So what it turned out had happened in her case is that her calf had contracted brucellosis. She was unable to expel it and that had caused her to die of septicemia. Toxoplasmosis is also a problem for these guys. So the grey here is showing areas where the dolphins are found and the black where dolphins are particularly densely uh, populated. The fractions show the proportion of dolphins that have tested positive for tox toxoplasmosis along with the number of fatal cases. And what you can see is that there's quite a few fatal cases. The dolphins are thought to contract this because cats are allowed outside, they're pooping, toxoplasmosis, cysts are getting shed into the waterways and then cats are, uh, sorry, dolphins are ingesting them. And one of the concerns we have is perhaps lower genetic diversity could be causing the dolphins to be more susceptible to disease, particularly in areas like uh, the Maui Dolphin Range where there are just so few of them. So what we're hoping um, is that potentially there might be some kind of miraculous recovery of genetic diversity. And the pos possibility for this rose its head back with Rebecca Hammer's work, who is another alumni from Hatfield, when she published this back in 2014. So this was based on samples taken between 2010 and 2012. And in this Maui dolphin pie at the very top, you can see a small segment of haplotypes that don't look like the rest of the Maui dolphins. And these are Hector's dolphin-like haplotypes. So Becca also looked at the nuclear makeup of these dolphins. And these are these, those, those weird little dolphins right here. So they look very different to the Maui dolphins. A couple of them look like they might come from the west coast. And the remainder of them looked hectares-like, but couldn't be, a, couldn't be assigned back to a specific hectares population. So this raised really two really exciting uh, possibilities. One, that along with the few dolphins that have been found beach cast around the, long, the lower North Island, that there might be an unsampled Hector's dolphin population at the lower end of the North Island. And two, that dolphins from the Hector's dolphin population were swimming up to Maui dolphins. Obviously, if they could interbreed, that would in introduce a lot of genetic diversity into the very critically endangered Maui dolphin. However, work that Debbie and Scott have been doing have so far failed to turn up any instances of these dolphins interbreeding with each other. So another possibility is that they might be profoundly different and unable to interbreed. So to look at these questions, my current project is using hologenomics to try and look at what levels of genetic interchange might have occurred between these subspecies, um, how the population sizes have changed over time, particularly in response to anthropogenic uh, uh, effects, how inbreeding has affected both their genomic and microbiomic uh, characteristics, and then finally whether there might be any signatures of susceptibility or resistance to, uh, to disease. So what is hologenomics? It's when you look at both the genome and the microbiome of the animals together as a single unit of evolution. So idea, the idea is that they're co-evolving and the evolution is acting on the holobiome to change both the genome and the microbiome of the animals. So I would be remiss in saying that everyone's on board with this concept. They're not. One of the big problems is that a lot of the bugs probably spend a bit of their time living out in the environment and then spend part of their life associated with the dolphins. In this case, because they're not spending the whole time together, processes that are impacting on the microbiomes aren't wholly the same that are processing on, uh, impacting on the dolphins. Um, however, hologenome has caught on as a term. So what I guess I'm saying is I haven't drunk the Kool-Aid, but I think it's a good term to try and encompass what we're trying to get at with this project. And this quote's really good. So it's basically talking about whether it matters that it's not strictly true if we're just using it as a concept to try and capture what we're getting at with this project. So to get at this project, we're generating a whole bunch, or a whole bunch, two high quality genomes using 10x uh, uh, techniques and a uh, high seeded further scaffold. We're then going to be sequencing a whole bunch of dolphins, so resequencing to low depth. Um, and we're targeting 59 individuals, which are represented by 76 different samples. Although we're just going to do each of the genomes once, because each of the samples from the same dolphin should have the same genome, hopefully. We're also going to pro um, profile the microbiome community using 16 sRNA targeted um, sequencing. And the reason for this is that our low coverage genome sequencing is only going to pick up the most prevalent microbiome critters. So we want to try and get a more comprehensive idea of what different bugs are living on the dolphins. So what are we hoping to get at this? We're hoping to get at how the population sizes have changed over time, 
and in periods of high and low gene flow between these guys. One of our more out there ideas is perhaps being able to use the microbiome as a more fine scale idea of what's been going on in these populations, given the faster mutation rates of uh, bacteria compared to the dolphins. So in the following few slides, I've got the analyses we want to do with the host on the left, and the analyses we want to do with the microbiome on the right. The diagrams are the general juge of what we're trying to get at, and then for the more genetics-y folks, I've got the specific analyses we're hoping to do on the bottom. So using similar techniques to looking at population size changes, we also want to try and get at how long ago these populations split off from each other. We're interested in levels of inbreeding within these dolphins and the different populations, and the potential impacts this might have on their microbiome diversity. We're also interested in patterns of local adaptation, particularly as they don't seem to be interbreeding. So this may suggest that there might be adaptations which are stopping them from being able to come back into secondary contact. And finally, we're interested in whether there might be patterns of, uh, of outlying adaptation between dolphins which have died due to disease versus those that have died due to other causes, like getting chomped on by sharks or caught in fishing nets. So I've been talking about the genome and the microbiome data separately here, but one of the promises of hologenomics is trying to bring this data together and, and analyze the interactions with it. And to do this, because it's so highly dimensional, we're likely going to have to turn to things like machine learning to try and make sense of this data set. So there are a number of potential issues. One is that dolphins live in the marine environment, which is just completely full of bugs. So when these samples are taken, there's the potential that we could be sampling seawater microbes alongside of them. To try and get at this, we're going to be uh, collecting seawater samples to try and characterize the background uh, bugs that are going on. But we're not too, uh, <laughs> Debbie just shaking her head, not to look for dolphins, Debbie, just to look for the bugs that live there. <laughs> um, one of the reasons we're not too concerned about this is there's some great research that's come out of Amy April's lab which shows that the microbiome of humpback whales appears to be very distinct from the seawater surrounds. We're not going to throw out um, the data if it's also found in the seawater. And that's because there are uh, uh, these bugs, like in option C here, and on the diagram on the left here, that are found partially through time on the dolphins. So these are likely to be things that might be important for dolphin health. Although it would probably be a very good idea to exclude them from analyses of geographic differentiation, seeing as they appear to be picking them up from the local seawater. Another issue is uh, post-mortem invasion. So the dolphin on the left here looks very different from the dolphin on the right. And that's largely due to microbial processes that are going on. So there's a number of ways we're going to try and look at this. Um, number one being that we've got dolphins that were sampled by a biopsy while alive and then sampled through stranding events after death. So we can directly compare how the microbial community may have changed. We're also planning on comparing our RNA to DNA, sorry not our RNA, just RNA to DNA from uh, a number of internal tissues which are held at the University of Massey. And that's because RNA depletes very quickly. And what it means is that we'll reflect bugs that, are, that were growing at the time of sampling event, whereas DNA hangs on a lot, a lot longer. So if there's things that are more prevalent in the RNA compared with the DNA, they may be bugs that are responsible for causing decomposition processes. So where are we up to? I have gone up and I've subsampled all the tissues, getting back into the lab after a good two years break. It was good times. Um, and we're actually currently, I uh, have just finished Maori consultation. So, from a Western viewpoint, these, this sampling process appears to change things dramatically from dolphin to tissue to DNA to genetic data. But uh, dolphins are considered um, sacred to Māori because they are the grandchildren of Tangaroa, the sea god. And there are a lot of concerns, especially following the Nagoya Protocol, about making sure that indigenous peoples get to benefit from genomics data that we generate. So although it changes uh, form from a Western perspective, Underneath, to Māori, this reflects the, the sacred dolphin the whole way through. So consultation about where we do our sequencing and how we're going to store our data afterwards is really important just to make sure that we bring people along with us. Okay, so they may seem like super disparate projects, but hopefully I've, pr I've convinced you guys that they're united by the power of using this time-travelling genetic uh, aspect to look at what's going on through population sizes through time and levels of hybridisation, and that by including other ecological data, we can get at why some of these processes have been occurring. But an alternative title for this uh, talk could have definitely been, how do you practice field work or how do you avoid field work practice ecology? If we zoom on, on this beautiful photo of a humpback whale here, 
We can see these parasitic whale barnacles along for the ride. And much like this, I couldn't have done any of this work without parasitizing on the folks who actually go out and do the hard work and get the samples. Folks that gave me assistance with lab work and computation, who provided funding, or were just generally awesome. Um, that's it, and I'm, thank I'm happy to take questions. Well, thanks, Alana. Thanks for bringing us back to the marine environment. <laughs> All right. Question. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair comment. So the question is, would hybridization be a good thing? It comes down to how profoundly different they are or not. So yes, you're right. If they're fairly distinct, then that could be a bad thing. But there's also, um, there's no, I guess the thing is that we don't really know how natural that process is of Hector's dis, dis, uh, dispersing that to Maui. It may, be, it may be something that's been going on for a long time. So that's why we're hoping the genomic data will help inform us about that. If it looks like the interchange has been going on throughout time, then it's obviously a natural process and nothing we should be concerned about. If they've been distinct for a long time and now gene flow is occurring, you're right, that could be more problematic and it could be something that's been facilitated by the Maori population being so low and therefore there being space for the Hector's dolphins to disperse. My suspicion based on talking to researchers who've been digging through the historical records of these guys is that the population used to be reasonably continuous all the way up the west coast of the North Island and what we're seeing is an artificial fragmentation. They were defined as separate subspecies based on a number of subtle uh, morphological differences and uh, on having a distinct mitochondrial haplotype but not one that is reciprocally monophyletic compared to the rest. So it's nestled in amongst the Hector's diversity. So it's good questions and hopefully next time I come back I can talk a little bit more about what we think it means. I'm sorry that I don't have a question about all the fancy genetics. It's really more about the ecological thing with the sperm whales and the supposition that it might have been the prey, specifically the larger squid that lived at depth. And the temperatures at depth, I'm not sure are actually all that different or were, or if there's data to support that or not. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on that. That's fair, especially for giant squid, right? Um, yeah. The jumbo squid, I, I could imagine that maybe the temperature might be a bit more influential. So I probably should refu re not refer to giant squid next time I give this talk to stop me getting put in an awkward position at question time <laughs> afterwards. Um, so we don't really have a solid idea about why, why that pattern is. So the, the prey is mostly speculation. Um, what it looks like based on patterns of mitochondrial DNA is that the Atlantic, modern Atlantic sperm whale population was populated by whales from the Pacific. And what we can't really explain is why the whales weren't present in the Atlantic in the first place, because sperm whales have a reasonably long evolutionary history. Um, so I'm, I'm very welcome to other people maybe coming up with other ideas. One, or two, one, one potential explanation is that they were just isolated to the Pacific and during warming um, periods they could disperse around and into the Atlantic. So it might not be necessarily driven by prey, but that latitudinal band. Um, another potential, which was a little shaky in our data, so we didn't put it on the, in the paper, is that it looked like the modern Atlantic sperm whales may have replaced a population that was there previously. Um, but that, uh, that would cause, because we haven't sampled that historical Atlantic population, it sort of shows up in our data and kind of mysterious ethereal ways that we didn't feel confident putting past peer review, but it looked almost similar to patterns you might see with human replacements coming in um, via out of Africa. So, yeah. So com some competitive exclusion? Yeah, or potentially the ones that were in the, in the Atlantic, if there was some kind of reason that it was inhospitable, were um, died out and then the, yeah, it's very difficult to say when you get back. What we're really helpless is some ancient DNA stuff, but uh, those sperm whale fossils have been difficult to come by. So, uh, question. Brucellosis <laughs> is cow. Mm, or and sheep. Pato blood and sheep. And sheep, right. And Zealand, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the Tatoblatosis is cat. Mm -hmm. 
uh, are you including uh, more genomic analysis of those vectors themselves, disease vectors themselves? Because there is known to be quite a lot of variation in, for example, toxoplasmosis strain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so toxo the toxoplasmosis <laughs> results are mostly coming from a collaborator, um, Wendy Rowe, at the University of Massey. And she does denotate them. So toxoplasmosis is actually really difficult to sample. They form these intense hard cysts when they're shed by cats. To extract the DNA, you tend to have to grind in liquid nitrogen, then boil, and then grind in liquid nitrogen again. So it's something that isn't necessarily going to be very easy to query from the environment using eDNA approaches. But her results have shown that it's an atypical form and seems to be one that is shared by um, I believe manatees are affected by it as well. No, which one's the one in Australia? Dugongs? Yeah. Worst marine mammal biologist ever. <laughs> um, so yeah, it seems to be something that may be increasingly prevalent. Um, it's also being found in the case of a number of fatal events in birds. So in native New Zealand birds. So it's um, a good reason to keep your cats indoors if you've got cats. Yeah. One more question, Any, Any from the... Electronic world? Okay. That's, that's probably bare o'clock anyway. Well, thanks so much. All right. Great. Yeah.